Welcome to Spring Creek Church Online. If you're joining us today, we're in a series that I'm calling Fruitful. It's looking at the fruit of the Spirit as described in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But what a lot of people don't realize is if you're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, you're not just talking about the qualities that God wants to produce in your life and mine. We're talking about who God is because these are the qualities that define God. And so it's been so enjoyable to me just to have these few weeks to just drill down on who God is, what he's like, why he is such an amazing and good, good father. I hope that today's message will really resonate with you as it has with me. Before we get started, let's just pray together. Father, thanks so much that we have this time now to gather around your word, to, to worship you, to, to let our hearts and minds engage with truth and lift you up and thank you for all that you are. God, I pray that you would just be at work with whenever people are watching this message, that it will just touch something within them, their mind, their heart, that it will stir them, God, to desire more and more to look more like you. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. If you were to ask the average Christian, you know, of all the fruit of the Spirit that are mentioned, which one or ones do you think you need the most? A lot of people would say, you know, I want or need more patience. <laughs> Quite a few hands would raise when you mentioned self-control. People would even admit that they need a greater capacity to love. But goodness is the one fruit that they would likely never or hardly ever mention. It's without a doubt the most underrated virtue of all the fruit of the Spirit. We don't understand goodness. And the way we use the word good today contributes to our misunderstanding. Let me explain. How many times a day do you say things like, good morning, good luck, good job? Good is literally one of the most common words in all the English language, but it's become a throwaway word. Uh, when you're asked how you're feeling, you might say, well, I'm good, without really giving it much thought. Or let's say you're with a friend and they want to watch their favorite movie. And when it's over, they look at you and they ask, well, what did you think? <laughs> and you say, it was good. But that's just because you don't want to hurt your friend's feelings and tell them what you really thought. Typically, when we use the word good, we use it to describe things that weren't necessarily great, but also weren't terrible, as in, it was good, but I've had better. Or it seems today, wherever you go, people want you to rate your experience. The self-checkout stands at Walmart, ask you to rate your experience after you've gone through checking out yourself. And I think, well, I did an exceptional job checking out my stuff, so I should give myself five stars. But if I click five stars, Walmart's going to think I mean them. So I just don't. I skip the rating system altogether. Today, when you're asked to give a rating on something, often you're told what a one means and a two and a three and a four and a five. So the scale would look something like this that I put on your screens. Poor, fair, good, very good, and excellent. And where's good on that scale? It's right in the middle. Not great, not bad, just mediocre. What I'm saying is, good doesn't mean good anymore. If you tell someone they did a good job, they might take it as an insult. What do you mean? It was only good. In our competitive, high-achieving society, no one wants to just be good. You might as well call me average or below average because people aren't looking for good employees. They want creative, skilled, charismatic, passionate employees, but not good ones. So our overuse and our misuse of the word good contributes to our misunderstanding of goodness or the state of being good. But you should know in the Bible, good and goodness are very important words. So that's where I want to begin today by answering the question, what is goodness? Let's begin with the Old Testament Hebrew word, which is tov. The Hebrew word tov was used to describe five different facets of that which is good. Here's the first facet. Something is good if it has good results. For example, if it was a good year for crops and you produced a healthy yield, or you had a good year financially because you made a decent profit off your investments, we would call that tov. It was good because you had good results. And second, good is something that's desirable. It's like when you find a person attractive inside and out. You desire to get to know that person better. Or you find a watch, a camera, a computer that's well designed and has all the functions you'll ever need, we would call that tov. If something has characteristics or qualities that are desirable to us, then it's a good thing. And third, good describes something of high quality. 
So Tov is something that's not a cheap knockoff. It's not inferior. Instead, it's the best of its kind. Good in God's book is never average. It's never mediocre. It never falls in the middle of the scale. Tov is always exceptionally good. It's five stars. It's the best of the best. And fourth, good is something that's not evil. So Tov not only refers to a quality of something, but to the absence of anything that would detract from that quality. When we say God is good, it's because his intentions are good, his plans are good, his purposes are good for us. There's never ever, ever any evil intent in anything that God does. And then finally, good refers to one's highest good. So it refers to the highest good that a person could do for another. Now you and I, we have a lot of choices in life, but some choices aren't as good as others. Let me give you an example. Uh, recreational drugs, they may make a person feel good, but in the long run, we know these types of drugs are not good for us. I mean, why do you think people become addicted to drugs? It's not because they enjoy living life on the street or spending every minute of every day trying to find more money to buy more drugs. It's not because they enjoy the lifestyle that drugs lead to. But drugs do give us a good feeling temporarily and a temporary good only. There are many things that we do that make us feel good but really aren't good for us in the long run. They're not in our best interest. They're not for our highest good. So when we say God is good, we're saying that he knows what's best for us, wants what's best for us, and only brings into our life what's best for us. That's the Old Testament understanding of goodness. So now let's shift gears and let's talk about the New Testament Greek, which is agathosune. The first thing we learn about agathosune is this. Goodness is acting in a benevolent way on behalf of others. Here's the actual dictionary definition. Goodness, the Greek agathosune, means to do good for another's benefit. For example, Jesus showed agathosune when he stood by the woman caught in the act of adultery. Remember, it was agathosune, this goodness that made him say to the men holding the stones ready to kill the woman, let the one without sin cast the first stone. Jesus protected the woman, stood his ground against her accusers. That's goodness because it acts in a benevolent way on behalf of this woman who has no one on her side. So agasothune is active goodness. It means more than just excellence of character. It's character that's been energized, expressing itself in doing good or doing what's good in the interest of others. Here's another aspect of agasothune. Goodness always balances truth and love. In other words, goodness doesn't viciously chew someone out. Numerous Bible verses tell us to be gentle and kind with one another. So goodness doesn't negate kindness that we learned about last week. Paul himself is a model of tact and diplomacy when it comes to dealing with the difficult circumstances within congregations in the New Testament. I mean, think about it. Most of the New Testament are really letters that Paul wrote to young churches who were dealing with problems. And Paul always spoke truthfully, but always did so in the most loving way he could. Dr. Timothy Keller described counterfeit goodness as truth without love. I mean, have you ever heard a Christian blister and humiliate someone with whom they disagreed? I think we probably all witness this from time to time. Far too often, people like that excuse themselves by saying, I'm just telling the truth. But what they were really doing was offloading frustration and anger in an inappropriate way. Love is always evident in truth-telling when goodness is involved. Goodness never lets a truth that needs to be told get in the way of a person that needs to be loved. There's another aspect of this New Testament word for goodness, and it's this. Goodness is inside-out integrity. The Old Testament scholar Christopher Wright described goodness like this. I think one key, one key thing would be integrity, an absence of any kind of guile or deception. Truly good people are W-Y-S-I-W-Y-G. What you see is what you get. They are in reality all they appear to be. Their words and behavior on the outside matches what's going on inside. There is no sham or pretense. When they do good, it's not just some kind of play acting to get a good name or a good photo op or a good sound bite. Good people do what they do simply because it's the right thing to do. So I don't know if you've ever known a person like that, but man, are they attractive. I mean, they radiate inside out integrity in all that they do. John Maxwell described someone like that this way. He said, true success is when people who know you best respect you most. So you could say a person is truly good when others gain access to every part of their life and nothing disappoints or shocks them. Then there's this final thing. 
Agasathune, this goodness, can be described like this. Goodness involves generous giving to bless others. One synonym for Agasothune is generosity. God, of course, is the perfect pattern for this. Listen to James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. God is a giver. That's his nature. But it's also an expression of his goodness. He gives good gifts to us all. And most times, when we talk about how good God has been to us, we're usually talking about something tangible that God did. Let me give an example. We used to have a family in this church, and the husband was an orthotist from Germany. He was especially good at designing footwear for people who'd had accidents, deformities, diabetes, or surgical procedures that required modification to their shoes. So he worked at a shoe store in Plano. And before I ever ran my first marathon in Chicago, he told me I needed to come see him so he could test how I ran and how I walked to fit me with a proper shoe because Heinz was an expert in biomechanics. So he explained to me how Brooks Shoes is a company that designs their shoes based on how a person walks or runs. Because believe it or not, we all walk and run differently. Some of us, when we walk, our heels strike first. Others are more flat-footed. Others tend to land on the front of their foot. Some of us, our feet tend to roll toward the outside when we're walking or running. Others, it toward the inside. There's just a lot more to walking and running than we imagine. So what Brooks does is design running shoes to fit with the individual way you walk or run to give you the best support that fits your pattern of running. So my Brooks shoes are called Brooks Adrenaline, just in case you're thinking about what you could buy me for my birthday that's coming up on December 10th, which is just around the corner. Anyway, the amazing thing about these shoes is I've never blistered my feet when I wear them, even when I ran 26.2 miles four different years in the Chicago Marathon. They fit perfectly, support my feet just right, so the right shoes combined with the right socks make all the difference when it comes to walking and running. But the only downside is that Brooks Adrenaline shoes usually cost about $120 a pair. So needless to say, I don't buy them that often. Well, just last week, I was thinking about how my old walking shoes had really had it. Uh, They're nearly worn out just from my daily walks, and the tread on the bottom of the shoes is nearly gone. And so Brendan and I, we went into Thrift Giant, not looking for anything in particular. And lo and behold, I saw a pair of black and white Brooks Adrenaline shoes and a great light shined down upon them. I picked them up and they were size 12 and a half. Again, just in case you're taking notes. And they looked like they had been worn for maybe a week and someone thrifted them. I mean, nowhere at all on the bottom of the shoes. And here's the best part. They were only $23. (laughs) Now, I know it's not a parting of the Red Sea kind of miracle. But I just had to say to myself, look at you, God, showing off and giving me a new pair of shoes just when I needed them most. And that's what I mean when I say whenever we talk about the goodness of God, most times we're talking about something tangible that he did for us. You needed something and someone ended up giving you the very thing you needed or you found a great bargain on it when you least expect it. Or someone showed up in your life with a perfect word of encouragement when you were feeling empty and depleted. Or you received an unexpected refund, a bonus, or a gift from a friend when you were worried about having enough money to pay the rent. That's agasathune. It's goodness that's expressed in a tangible kind of way. In other words, God is good to me, and he gives me good things. So now that you better understand what goodness means, let's look at God in light of all that in my next point that I call God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. As kids, one of the first things we learn about God is that he's good. In many of our homes, one of the first prayers we were ever taught to pray went like this, God is great, God is good. Let us thank him for our food. In that simple prayer, we underscore that God is good. But somehow that fact sounds rather ho-hum to us. Uh, We want a deity with more pizzazz. We want a God who's amazing, spectacular, majestic, phenomenal, and stupefying. And while it's true that God is all those things and more, From cover to cover in the Bible, the one attribute the authors of scriptures repeatedly come back to is the simple fact that God is good. David wrote this, you are good and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but the original Saxon word for God is the good. So the word God is literally derived from the word good. When we say that God is good, we mean that his love is good, his power is good, his mercy is good, and his holiness is good. Every attribute of God is good. It's his goodness that holds all the other attributes together. 
Because if God had power but he didn't have love, he would not be good. If he had patience but had no wisdom, he would not be good. All his attributes complement each other because God is a good, good father. Which leads us to this. The goodness of God is more than an attribute. Think of it like this. The goodness of God is really a lens or a perspective through which we must view everything else about God. Author and theologian Richard Niebuhr once said, most of our problems in life come because we refuse to believe that God is as good as he says he is. In the biblical account of the fall of Adam and Eve, it's significant that Satan's strategy was to attack the goodness of God. All he had to do was convince Eve that God was not good because Satan suggested that God was withholding something they needed that was good for them. If they could eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they'd have everything they ever wanted or needed. Satan undermined Eve's confidence in the goodness of God. And once he convinced Eve that God was not good, the fall took care of itself. It was easier for her to disobey God when she believed that God was not acting in her best interest. By changing Eve's perspective of God, Satan persuaded her to disobey by eating the forbidden fruit. Here's the thing to keep in mind. Our actions always follow our beliefs. And Satan's strategy hasn't changed in a thousand years. To get you to sin, his first attack is always on the character of God. Oh, sure, God may have given you this command not to do this or that, but... How can that be bad for you when it feels so good? God really doesn't have your best interests at heart. You see, that's an attack on the goodness of God. And once we doubt God's goodness, once we believe God is withholding something that would be good for me, sin just takes care of itself. That's why the goodness of God is so important. It's the perspective from which I must view all the commandments of God. Eve didn't understand why God said no, but knowing that God was good should have been enough for her. Because whatever a good God forbids must not be good for me. Which also means when I know God is good, obedience comes easier. I trust that God knows best, even when I don't understand. Here's something else to keep in mind about the goodness of God. Goodness has its source in God. C.S. Lewis said it like this, There is but one good, that is God. Everything else is good when it looks to Him, or bad when it turns from Him. You see, goodness is based on a very high standard. It's based on God himself. He is the standard of goodness, who God is and what God does. That's true goodness, moral excellence, complete uprightness. God is the standard by which all other good is measured. Not your feelings, not my feelings, not what the crowd says about it, but God has the final say because he's the standard of good. Think of it like this. Only God's goodness is absolute. All others are. All others have degrees of goodness as measured against this absolute standard. So the Bible returns to this truth over and over again that God is the source of goodness. Luke tells the story of a rich young ruler coming to Jesus one day and calling Jesus a good teacher. And then Jesus does this. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. So Jesus makes the point that anything we call good must have its source in God. Because no one is good except God alone. It doesn't matter how good something looks or how good it makes you feel. If it's not from God, it's not good. Now, some people get confused by what Jesus said here. Was Jesus saying that he was not good because only God is good? No, not at all. Jesus is asking a more important question. Why do you call me good unless you actually recognize that I'm God? Because if only God is good and you're calling me good, does that mean you recognize my deity? Jesus wants to know if this man understands who he is. There's another really interesting story in the Old Testament where Moses gets a glimpse of God's goodness. Do you remember this? Moses had a number of intimate encounters with God. Uh, He met God first at the burning bush when Moses was called to lead the Israelites out of the slavery in Egypt. Uh, Moses prayed to God and watched as God parted the Red Sea. Moses climbed to the top of Mount Sinai, received the law and the Ten Commandments directly from God himself. Moses took those Ten Commandments back to the people of Israel, only to discover within a matter of a few days they had returned to worshiping idols and forgotten about God. So in his anger and distress, Moses broke the tablets and then went back to God for for some encouragement. That's where this passage picks up. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, and God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. So Moses asked God to show him his glory, thinking that that would encourage him the most, just to see God's glory in its fullness. 
But God said, I'm not going to show you my glory, Moses. Instead, I'm going to show you my goodness. So God covers Moses in the cleft of the rock and lets Moses see a glimpse, just the backside of his goodness. And that exposure, that one exposure to the goodness of God was enough to make the face of Moses glow. Now think about this. If we could just see the backside of God's goodness, our faces would be glowing too, radiant with the glory of God, which means God's glory is just a manifestation of God's goodness. Instead of the glory of God, Moses saw the goodness of God. He saw the source of the glory of God. The source of God's glory is his absolute goodness. I think sometimes we're a little bit like Moses. We want to see God's glory. We think of God's glory as much more exciting and attractive than God's goodness. We, we want the spectacular, dazzling light. We want the show. But in this account, God, who has perfect glory and perfect goodness, chose to restrain his glory so that Moses could see his goodness. And in that moment, when Moses' heart was full of despair at the sin of God's people, the goodness of God gave Moses new hope and a new start, and his face showed it. And that's really my prayer for you today that you begin to see the goodness of God. Because if you really saw God in his goodness, your life would never be the same. And that's what leads us to this vitally important truth. God is as good as Jesus made him out to be. Now, this is one of those statements you should really memorize. If I had a plaque in my home, it wouldn't say, eat, pray, love. <laughs> it would say, God is as good as Jesus made him out to be. Because this is the truth I have thought about for hours meditate on it, carried it in my heart on long walks with God. I've rehearsed it over and over again until I no longer doubted it. All day long, for days on end, I would meditate on it and repeat it. God is as good as Jesus made him out to be. Here's what I know. If you want to see God more clearly, you need to see Jesus more clearly. You have to learn to meditate on Christ and his example. Because Jesus told us explicitly, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. What Jesus is saying is that he is the clearest picture of God we've ever seen. You and I will never get a better picture of God and what he's like unless and until we look into the life of Jesus. So this phrase, God is as good as Jesus made him out to be, is one of those phrases that's absolutely essential for your good and your growth. Because once you believe this truth, then it's difficult to embrace the idea that God is looking down on people and saying things like, I need to discipline you, so I'm going to give you inoperable cancer. Or she's unkind. I think I'm going to cause her to lose all of her family in a tragic car accident so that she'll come around. Because it's impossible to get that kind of message from Jesus. Folks, Jesus brought healing. He never brought disease. He gave help. He never sent tragedy. I let Jesus' life define God for me because he said to see him is to see the Father. He also said he only did what he saw his Father doing. So here's my point. If God is as good as Jesus made him out to be, then suffering isn't so much something that's sent to us as something that comes to us. Suffering comes because we live in a world where bad things happen. And if bad things can happen to anybody, then bad things can happen to you and me. But Jesus in his ministry was always on the side of helping, healing, and bringing hope. That's who God is. He's really that good. When I see what Jesus was willing to do for me on the cross... I know there's truly no limit to the good he'll do for me today. Listen to this by Paige Benton Brown. Could God be any less good to me on the average Tuesday morning than he was on that monumental Friday afternoon when he hung on a cross in my place? So learn to meditate on the person of Jesus Christ. God is as good as Jesus made him out to be. And that leads to this final question. Can we be good like God? So first, God's goodness manifests in our good works. So let me start off by sharing some scriptures and a couple of quotes. Here's Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Or there's this in the book of Ephesians. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul also said this in Titus, the saying, the saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Or how about this from John Wesley? He was the founder of the Methodist Church. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, and in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. And then there's this from Bishop Desmond Tutu. 
Do your little bit of good where you are. And it's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. True goodness is inseparable from godliness. As I said earlier, all goodness has its source in God. So when we're godly, we reflect the goodness of God. But even our best goodness is not perfect, is it? Good people still have failures. Let me just say, it's the direction of our desires that gradually determines our character, not necessarily the degree of perfection we achieve. I mean, this is why David is called a man after God's own heart, despite having a number of serious failures in his life. The sins he committed were contrary to the will and way of God, but his desires were to please God. And he repented of his failure in humility and tears. Peter also exhibited the same desire to be good like God, even though he fell in such a humiliating way when he denied Jesus three times. Many years later, Peter would say this with confidence, Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Remember, this is written by a guy who blew it big time. So we already know Peter's life was far from perfect. But if Peter could say that after his colossal failure, after years of following Jesus, live such good lives that when people look at you, they give credit to God. That's what God can do in the life of those fully yielded to him. Here's another way we do good. Do good to those who bring you God's word. Remember what I said when we were defining agasothune? Agasothune, the Greek word for goodness, is a synonym for generosity. So it's not just about being good, but includes giving good things to other people, just like God gives good things to us. Did you know that the first mention of tithing in the Bible, which is giving 10% of your income, is found in Genesis 14? So tithing predates the law by several hundred years. The very first gift of 10% was given to a priest named Melchizedek. Abraham gave Melchizedek 10% of his income to care for the man of God who was doing the work of God. So once the tithe is established in the Old Testament, once again, we're told the Levite tithe was tied to supporting God's workers. You see, God put his servants in a position of forced dependency. As workers for God, they were totally dependent on the generosity or the goodness of God's people to survive. Either God's people would come through for them, or else they'd be forced to abandon God's work to go find some other way to provide for their families. And sadly, that did actually happen from time to time in the Old Testament. But this was always God's expectations. He wants his workers taken care of. Once you move from the Old to the New Testament, both Jesus and Paul address the same issue. Here's Jesus speaking to it. These 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or a bag for your journey or even two tunics or sandals or a staff for the worker is worthy of his support. And to whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it and abide there until you go away. So Jesus clearly tells his disciples, you're to take no money, no gold, no silver, no copper, Then he adds in verse 10, for the worker is worthy of his support. So clearly Jesus is saying, if you're working for me, you should expect those to to, to whom you minister to support you. Why? Because the worker is worthy of the support. So once again, God puts his workers in a position of forced dependency. Does that make sense? Without giving the giving of God's people, God's workers will suffer and so will the work of God. Then Paul builds on this teaching of Jesus and makes a direct correlation between the priesthood of the Old Testament and the pastor in the New Testament. Look at this in 1 Corinthians 9. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered at the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So Paul tells the Corinthians, those who make their living from the gospel are a lot like the priests in the Old Testament. The priests received their food from the tithes and offerings of the people. And Paul is saying, same deal today. Just like the priests enjoyed the support of God's people, those who preach the gospel should likewise be compensated by God's people. He saw no difference in how the priests and pastors were to be paid. Now you might wonder, what does this have to do with the fruit of the Spirit? Well, everything. Remember, goodness in the Bible is always expressed in a tangible, generous way. 
In fact, right after Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, in the very next chapter, chapter 6, Paul uses this word goodness, agasothune, again, when Paul says this, the one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. The good things we're to share with those who teach the word, that's agasothune. It's my generosity. It's goodness that expresses itself in a tangible way to bless those who minister to us. In other words, the pastor shares good things from God's word and the people share out of their material blessings with the pastor. Now, let me just pause for a minute and say this. This is not a passive aggressive sermon. <laughs> I don't think I'm treated poorly. I just think it's important for all of God's people to understand God's huge heart for his workers and the obligation of the people of God to provide for them. This is actually the primary reason for giving to the church. You know, sometimes we get before our people and we, we talk about how Spring Creek helps the poor and, and we support community nonprofits and so on and so forth. And those things are all great and stuff we should be doing as a church for sure. But the primary reason you and I are to give to the church is to share out of the good things God has given to us for those who are giving you good things from God's word. You should also know that there's no pastor here at Spring Creek getting rich off the gospel. We all live in average homes. We shop at the same places like you, that you do, like Target and Walmart and Goodwill and Thrift Giant. <laughs> I've got no private plane, no mansion except in heaven, and I drive a 13-year-old Camry. But in the same way that being good means giving in a tangible way to help others, God wants his people to be a model of generosity in how they support their pastors. Then the final thing when it comes to being good like God is this. Share God's goodness with others. The Bible says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. This has been beautifully summed up in the words of, that I read from Cardinal Suhard. He says this, to be a witness does not consist in engaging in propaganda, nor even in stirring people up, but in living an, uh, but being a living mystery. It means to live in such a way that one's life would not make sense if God did not exist. You know, I once read the testimony of a, a man who serves for some years in the British Navy, but he'd gone into the Navy as a confirmed atheist. He didn't believe in God. He had nothing but contempt for all forms of religion. He never intended to get involved in religion for his life. But for some months, he was on a rather small ship, only a few men with a crew. And one of the other men on the crew who, who, who he saw every day, shared his meals with, could not escape from, was a committed Christian. This committed Christ follower did not preach to him, didn't quote the Bible to him, but just live a life of goodness in front of his eyes day after day, week after week, month after month. This atheist saw in this fellow crew member something he could not explain. It was a kind of life he'd never seen before. After years of service alongside this good Christian, he said, I would have never opened a Bible, but I could not help reading the life of this man. Eventually, he convinced me that there must be a God. So that man who went into the British Navy as an atheist came out as a confirmed believer in Jesus Christ. What was the Bible that convinced him? A Bible written in flesh and blood. The life of a man who lived out his faith without too much religiosity, without too much preaching, just a very good man who reflected the goodness of God. You know, when I hear that testimony, it, it does make me remember the often quoted saying, remember your life may be the only Bible that someone will ever read. You know, even people uh, who never hear from your lips that you're a Christian, would they know by reading the pages of your life that you are? From the outside, would they see something different about you that was compelling, desirable, and not like other people? Let me wrap up with this. I, I generally don't like to tell people I'm a pastor, not because I'm ashamed of it or embarrassed by it, but because people act weird <laughs> when they get around pastors. It's like the story about the boy who'd been trying to kill a rat in his shed for weeks. And while the kid's out in the backyard trying to figure out how he's going to kill that rat, the minister arrives at the house and comes inside to visit with his parents. But the kid doesn't know the minister's over at the house. Well, he sees the rat out of the corner of his eye and he springs into action. First, he took his baseball bat, clubbed the rat in the head. Then he took the rat by the tail and smacked him against the wall several times. Then to make sure he was dead, he pulled out his pocket knife and stuck it in him. And this kid is so proud of himself, he came running in the house, holding that dead rat by the tail, and yelled, Mom and Dad, I caught the rat. I beat him with a bat. I threw him against the wall. I stuck my knife in him. And then the kid notices that the minister's over there sitting in the corner. So he looks at the minister, he looks at the rat, and he says, And the Lord took him home. 
<laughs> that's what I mean by weird. People start using spiritual jargon because they think that's how we all talk. So I try to avoid telling people I'm a minister. After open heart surgery six years ago, I didn't tell any of the nurses or the staff who were helping me through that healing process that I was a minister. I was just Keith to them. But I was thanking them for anything and everything they did. And when I say I was thanking them, I mean I wasn't just saying please and thank you. That's important, but it's not enough. When I thank someone, I want to think about what made them to be the kind of person who would do something so nice, so kind, so generous for another human being. And I want to praise that quality. To just thank people for what they do can come off very transactional. People want to be thanked for who they are that makes them do what they do. And when you do that, it's so rare, people will always remember you. Well, along about the third day after surgery, the head nurse came into my room and said, I can tell you're a very wise man. Is there something I can talk to you about? Now, mind you, I'm not preaching sermons in the recovery room. I'm, I'm not quoting scripture. I'm not sharing the way to Jesus with everyone who walked in the room. I'm just being good to people who are often convenient targets for people in pain who lash out at caregivers when it's really just because they're hurting inside. But what this nurse saw in me was something different. Not he's a pastor, I could talk to him, but he's a kind-hearted, good person. I think I could talk to him. So she walked into my room. I got up from my bed and I was holding on to that gizmo, you know, that holds all the IV fluids attached to my arm. And she sat down on the edge of my bed. And in my mind, I'm thinking only God could come up with something like this. The caregiver and the patient have just switched roles. Here I am with all the wires and tubes coming out of my body, standing there talking to this nurse about the loss of her father. It was a really special moment, one for which I will always be grateful. But it was a door that God opened because she saw something different in me. And it wasn't spiritual lingo. It wasn't quoting scripture. It wasn't me preaching a sermon. She just saw goodness and kindness, and it opened the door to her heart. Your life may be the only Bible some people will ever read. If that's true, and it is, then what sort of message will they take away from reading your life? Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for who you are, that you are a good, good God. And I pray, if nothing else, that in our heart and mind, we will have a greater appreciation for what goodness is all about, that goodness is not mediocre, goodness is not middle of the line, goodness is not take it or leave it, goodness is the best of the best. And that's who you are. And God, you are so kind to us, and you do so many things for us, and you are so generous in how you pour into our lives. You are a good, good father, and your greatest goodness was shown when you sent your son and gave him so that we could have life with you. Wow, God, we'll never get over that. And I pray, God, that as your goodness manifests in us, as we yield and depend on your spirit, that your goodness begins to manifest more and more in us, that, God, it would be a magnet to people who surround our life, whether or not they know that we're a Christian, that they would know there's something different, there's something unique, there's something in this person that I like, that I desire, that I want for myself. God, I pray that your goodness would come shining through our life and draw all people to your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you, God, for being such a good, good father. You are so good to me. You're so good to us. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, thanks for being with us today. We're very near the end of this series. There's only three more messages in this series. Then Pastor Jared is going to be bringing a special message around Thanksgiving time. God bless you. Can't wait to see you again real soon.